Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald in Warsaw on the Mississippi River at the Alice L. Kibbe Life Sciences Station. This is where students at Western Illinois University learn their biology in the summertime. Two months during the summer, this place is buzzing with students and its proximity to the river make it a perfect place for biological studies. Behind me, the traditional classroom area that's been here since the 60s when they got this property. This is the new multi-use facility over here. We'll take a tour and we'll go out on the river and find out what the students learn. Well, Sean Jenkins, since, what, 2001? You've been the, you're, you're an assistant, you're associate professor, associate professor at Western Illinois, and you sort of oversee this Kibbe Life Sciences Biological Station. Yeah, I'm the director of the station. field station. Yeah. Have been since 2001. Mm -hmm. You've seen some improvements, haven't you? Yeah. Like the building that we're standing in right now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this was built through an NSF grant that we actually applied for in 2002, and then we actually got the grant in 2002, and the building was built by the end of 2004, yeah. the summer of 2004. Yeah. We're, we're in a large central sort of a meeting area. Mm -hmm. um, on each side of us, there's a wing for uh, students, like a dorm mm -hmm. situation. Yeah. There's a kitchen here, so this is where the, the, the food and the meeting and the greeting and the stuff goes yeah. on. Yeah, and actually they live here during the summertime. Students mm -hmm. can actually, if they're taking classes out here, they can live free of charge out here while they're taking mm -hmm. classes, so it's a pretty good deal for them. Right. I call it a biological station. You, you call it a life science station, Yeah, same right? thing. Yeah. yeah. What sort of biology goes on out here? Um, Class-wise, mm -hmm. we teach two four-week sessions every summer. The first session starts around May 13th or so and goes into the middle of June, and then the second session starts in the middle of June and goes to the middle of July. And we teach ornithology out here, um, herpetology, entomology, which is the study of insects. I teach uh, wetlands and aquatic plants. I teach advanced ecological techniques, ecological techniques. So most of the traditional classes you see in a biology field classes, mm -hmm. in a biology department or organismal classes we teach out here. And because it's accelerated, we meet four days a week, four hours a day. So it's a real chance for the students to get a lot of hand-on experience or hands-on experience because most of the classes have a very heavy fuel component because we're at the station. So. The big the big opportunity and the big advantage you have here is this body of water right here called right. the Mississippi River. You're yes. hard on the Mississippi River right here. Mm -hmm. So a lot of your, your stuff is aquatic. Yeah, a lot, of, your a lot of it's aquatic. And we do do a good bit in the uplands too, but a lot of it's focused around the river. Okay, let's take a look at this yellow portion right here. This mm -hmm. is the Kibbe Feet Life Sciences Station, yeah. right? This is your property. These other blocks that we see are owned by the Illinois DNR, DNR Department yeah. of Natural Resources. So you have a sort of contiguous body of land here that, yeah. that can be used as a reserve, huh? Mm-hmm. And what's interesting is we're also right across from, from a large metropolitan, or from fairly right. large metropolitan area. We're looking Kia at Kia 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 here, right, right. And so you, you really do see sort of what influences are on the river People mm -hmm. influences, population influence, as well as yeah. these. Uh, now, t tell me about the biological diverse, diversity, the ecological diversity that you've got. Well, here. as you can see from this map, beginning near the river, we have a lot of mature floodplain forest. This is actually owned by the DNR. Mm -hmm. um, this is right below Lock and Dam 19 right mm -hmm. here. So this is a large track of, of mature floodplain forest, and then Eagle Island and Mud Island are also large tracks of floodplain forest, as is the mainland right behind this little backwater slough here. Mm -hmm. um, and then moving up, this is Route 32. Once you get above there, this is the river hills along the river. We have a lot of mature upland forest. This is Cedar Glen right here, which mm -hmm. is a deep, deep, they're called glens because they're deep, deep valleys and they're usually lined with limestone bluffs along the glen or creek. And this is all mature oak hickory forest. And then we have several areas like here and here where we have um, tall grass prairie restorations. They used to be agricultural land, but back in the 70s they were planted back mm -hmm. to tall grass prairie. And then along the river bluffs, you can't really see them, we have a, some hill prairies, which are very mm -hmm. rare plant communities. And then in this area, this is actually um, Sand Prairie here, Sand Hills Nature Preserve, which is also owned by or managed by the DNR. So we have a lot of very rare plant community types and a lot of mature forest. And probably the biggest thing is that 
there's about 1,680 acres of continuous habitat. So you have a large chunk of habitat right. all in one area. Now during the course of this program, we're going to get to hear about uh, why it's called the Kibbe Life Sciences mm -hmm. Station. Um, we're also going to get to see, take a look at some of your classroom space here. But we're going to get to go out on the river. Because mm -hmm. this is what you really want your students to do is be able to have that kind of experience right. and learn what the river can teach them. Um, but, but first, before we go, let's, let's talk about Alice Kibbe, okay. for whom this is named. Mm -hmm. Why? Why is it named after her? Um, she was a professor and then chair of the biology department at Carthage College, which was right over at the county seat in Carthage, Illinois, mm -hmm. until 1962. At that time, they moved the college to Wisconsin and Kenosha, Wisconsin, right along Lake Michigan. And instead of giving the property, she initially brought, bought 115 acres right in here mm -hmm. where she would take her students during the summertime. She used it as a field station at her own expense to, for her biology classes. And when she was retiring, she gave the initial 115 acres to Western with the understanding that we would have a biological field station where we would teach biology and ecology mm -hmm. to local residents or to local students and do research. So that's what the station's been about since 1966 yeah. when the station first came into being. And we've offered classes every year since then, since that time. She was an amazing woman. She got her PhD at Cornell, and so she was quite an accomplished and world-renowned botanist. So she was a plant person like I am. But. Jim Lamer, we're in the old Frank house, and this served as the only building on, on this campus for a long time, didn't it, before right. the multi-use uh, building was added? Right, yep, and we have the new dormitory facilities over there. And we used the dorms, we used to have the girls' dorms upstairs mm -hmm. there which the girls had air conditioning, the guys didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and then as you go upstairs, the guy dorms yeah. uh, up there as well. So. Now you're working on a PhD. Correct. Right, uh, okay. And, uh, and you're also like the resident manager out here. Yep. I you live get here to live on this, but it's, that's wonderful, isn't it? Oh yeah, it's, uh, yep, can't complain about this job. Yeah, it's yeah. a great job. And then in the summer you teach. Do, yep, just the last year we started uh, implementing me into the uh, teaching curriculum. Yeah, that's here. great, that's great. Breeze me through this place if you would. Let's take a look at some of the classroom space. You go first. Sure, thank you. <clears throat> um, got some specimens right here. Some stuff right, that's found. This is all donated uh, mm -hmm. by one of our um, local Miss um, Decker. There's a picture of her there. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were kind of world travelers, and they ended up donating all this to the station here. And uh, so this little artifacts from here and there. Um, if you look over in this room, I'm actually the curator for the biology department um, for their herpetology collection. Oh, that could creep a lot of people um, out. I see a lot of snakes coil up in there. Right. So we, uh, so I bring out some specimens out here to work on, take them back. They're part of a larger collection mm -hmm. on the university. So. Okay. And uh, this looks like storage in here. That right. might have been the old kitchen for the uh, for the old house. Right. Yep. There's a lot of bottle storage here right now until we find out something else. We to can do with peek it. in one of the classrooms. This is the uh, one of the original classrooms. Right. And this would be what we consider our classroom and potentially wet lab, since we do have sinks and uh, access to water mm -hmm. in this. Um, we sort through a lot of specimens, and um, we also, if we have concurrent sessions out here. We can have this classroom and the other one going at the same time. Okay, and then this is the bigger ones down here, and this one actually looks looks like a this looks like a real science hall in here. It could get real messy in here, couldn't you? This, <laughs> yep, that's for sure. This is one of our main uh, laboratory areas here. And uh, you know, I, I mentioned you're working on your PhD. I'm going to show our audience this. Um, you you are studying the Asian carp. Right. Um, it's a joint project between the NRS program at U of I, Illinois Natural History Survey, and Western Illinois University, and looking at um, hybridization between the big head and silver carp throughout what the Mississippi River. What are these that we're looking at? These are all sections, cross sections of a bone, the post clethra, which is a bone out of the pectoral girl. And um, what we can do like this, just spine, like... Spine sections, huh? Right. Yeah. Yep. Just bone sections, hard structures, mm -hmm. and you can age them just like you would uh, growth rings in a tree. Mm -hmm. They have these periods of slow growth during the winter time, these lines of arrested growth that they deposit these lines and you can actually count them to actually determine the age of the fish. And you combine that with the length, um, you can get growth um, of fish at a mm -hmm. particular age. Well, we're gonna see some Asian carp later on today when we go down the river, aren't we? Um, yep, that's I the plan right now. Okay, so. <laughs> thanks. Sure. 
Neil Gillespie, we talked about in, in June and July, this place is buzzing with students who are all eager to learn about, about ecology and biology. You were one of them this summer. Right. Yeah. What are you studying? Um, wildlife ecology. Wildlife ecology. Yep. And you're working on a master's degree. Right. Right? Okay. And, and do you specialize? I mean, when you, when you take on a master's degree, do you specialize in anything? Right. Um, so I'm specializing in the Blanding's turtle. Um, it's a threatened or endangered species throughout much of its, or much of its range. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've found a small population that we're trying to find out more about. Really? Yep. Um, we were lucky enough to know there was one in storage here. Right. <laughs> so I'm going to turn this around so we can get a good look at it. Tell me about this critter. Well, this is a very young one. Um, the one we caught this summer was probably four times its size. Mm -hmm. um, it was a large female. Um, they are not very good swimmers. They like marshy habitats. Um, they take a long time to mature before they become they can become sexually active. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's like 12 to 15 years. And um, because a lot of the wetlands are being destroyed, a lot of their habitat's being destroyed, and so they aren't doing very well. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that a lot of their nests are being predated by things like raccoons and skunks. So they're taking big hits and they're not doing real well. Mm -hmm. and, and they're very rare, in fact, one of the rarest turtles in the country, I guess. Right. right and you want to find out from this population why there's a population here and why they're not right. doing better. Right. Okay. Gotcha. Good. And you're going to help us out on the river, right? Yeah. We're going to go. Maybe we'll see. Maybe we'll see a turtle. Yeah. Well, we'll probably <laughs> see turtles. Uh, probably not, not one this one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Yep. Jim, we just put the boats in the river, just north of the station at Keokuk. Was that two or three miles north of the river? Goes? Right around there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Lay the land out here for me. There's a big old dam back here. <clears throat> right, this is Lock and Dam 19. You can see the 119 gates all the way across. This dam's kind of unique. It's one of the first ones built on the Mississippi River, finished in 1913. It's kind of unique because it has the vertical lift gates drop from the top as opposed from the bottom, uh -huh. like most conventional dams on the river do. And the implications of that are that it's very tough for any sort of aquatic life to migrate upstream. Really the only way they can is over here. This is uh, one, of the, one of the two 1,200 foot locks on the river. This replaced this old lock chamber here uh -huh. uh, in 1957, um, basically to expand to accommodate more barges, five long and three wide. Now, th this boat that we're on is specifically designed to shock fish, right? correct? Okay. Right. What are we going to, how does that process work and what are we going to learn? Um, well, there's a lot of things you can get from shocking, especially uh, by standardized shocking. In that, um, one, species composition, find out what's here, what's in an area, mm -hmm. and also species composition, how many of certain species are in a certain area based on habitat, et cetera. Um, one of the reasons, you know, if we keep revisiting sites, the same sites over and over again, we can generate long-term data to actually detect trends in uh, distributions, composition, and structure okay. of fish communities. And so what we're going to do is send an electric shock down into the water. It paralyzes the fish, right? Right. What we're aiming for is something called narcolepsy, in where while the electric current's on the fish, their muscles tetanize and they're immobilized, and then when the current's off, they right themselves and swim away. So their air bladders allow them to remain buoyant while the shock is in the water, okay. and then as we go away, there's two other extremes, fright where you don't have enough and they can swim away, and tetany where they can completely tetanize and a fish mm -hmm. can almost drown, I guess, because they can't basically pump water across their gills. Okay. Well, let's let's start the process. All right. And it may good. get a little noisy, so we may have to speak above the generator, huh? Yep. Yeah, okay. that's for sure. Okay, let's give it a shot.
Jim, how'd we do? <laughs> oh, not too bad. It's pretty fairly typical. What we're we've got some natives, and we also have some uh, introduced species in here as well. Is that so, right? Yeah. Why, why don't you grab? This is an immense fish right here. Do you, can you grab that one first so we can get? It? What is that? A carp? Yep. Yeah, this is a common carp. They've been here since about the 1870s. Oh my goodness! Can you hold him up for us so we can get a good look at him? Well, I'll give it a shot anyway. All right. If it cooperates wow. here. Okay. Common common carp, huh? Right. They're uh, they're actually a very a large. They're in the minnow family. Ooh. They're a large, basically just a large minnow. They're a family Cyprinidae. Uh -huh. um, they have a, one with characteristic to them, they have kind of an orangish color. They have uh, two sets of barbels here on their snout, as well as a doubly serrated dorsal and anal spine. Now, the, the, these are barbels, these little hanging, hanging things here? What do they do, sense, sense things on the, on the floor right. of the river for them? Right, they, yeah, they just kind of help with orientation and also pick up chemical cues and when they route in through the substrate. They typically suck off the bottom. They're actually, they're omnivores, they eat just about anything, so. Okay, we're gonna measure him? Yep, we'll measure them and then we'll end up throwing them back. So, so common carp, um, 660, so it'd be in millimeters. What is that in inches? Well, I'll tell you here, <laughs> about 26 inches. 26 so, inches, okay, yep. what do you think he weighed? Um, if I had to guess, maybe around four pounds or so. So you want something different? Now here? you're, I'll tell you what, you're a, your specialty is the Asian carp. Did we get any of those? We did. Well, let's take a look at one of those. All right. That's what you're doing your PhD in, right? Correct. Yeah. They're, they're hard, they're slimy and hard to catch, aren't they? Right. Wow. This is one here. This is a silver carp. Okay, now this is the ones that are known for jumping into your boat. Correct. Or on your head in some cases, right? Right, yep. Yep, I think last year we had one jump on top of that canopy right there on that oh boat. So. <laughs> yep, they can. And why do they do that? Um, they're not 100% sure. I think it has something to do with the vibration. Uh, it's more like a fright response where when they sense something in the water, it's, they have this burst. Uh -huh. um, no one's exactly sure why they do it, but um, they're, <coughs> they're close sister attacks to the big head carp. They really don't jump like that. The big head don't. Right, and we didn't get any of those today. I didn't see, so. Um, this one is 695. Yeah, these guys were brought over around about 1972 or so, um, along with the big head carp. These are the for, ones that cause, are causing all the trouble because they're migrating. They, first, they started migrating from fish ponds, I guess, into the rivers, and now they're migrating north toward the Great Lakes. Right, they're extremely prolific, and they, they really are attracted to flow, high flows. So, you know, you get these major flood events, it triggers our estrus for spawning, as well as upstream movement. So um, it's a bad combination. It allows them to basically uh, travel throughout the Mississippi River Basin. Uh -huh. For a while, this lock and dam was actually serving as a barrier, but last year we really start to see the first signs of recruitment uh, young of the years. So they there. must have been going up the locks. Exactly, yep. They are probably locking through with the boats. Yeah, yeah. So. I'll be darned. Okay. Yep. But these guys are native planktivores, so they compete mainly with like gizzard chad. These typically compete phytoplanktivores, so filter down to around two to four microns. So mm -hmm. just go around filter feeding. They can, like this is probably only a two-year-old, maybe two or three-year-old wow. at the best. So they That's grow big. very large yes, very quickly. And how, how big would he get? Um, I think the biggest one we've had in Illinois is 34 pounds, but that's fairly extreme. Uh, 15 pounds is fairly typical on these guys, uh, maybe a little bit more. but. Now I noticed, uh, and I think it was gar. I, I pulled in three or four gar. Can you can you find one of those? Sure. Yep. This here is a short nosed gar. It's one of three species we have in this area, and um, one they have a. We also have long nosed gar, which have a very long, skinny uh -huh. uh, rostrum here, and we also have a spotted gar, which you find mainly in backwater habitats. Um, these are very common. They're uh, one of the most more ancient fish, and. Uh, one of our native species as well. A lot of people consider them rough fish. Um, Does anybody eat them? I mean, they're just real bony, aren't they? Right, a select few do. Um, <laughs> it, I think it's an acquired taste. But uh, it's a 560, but mm -hmm. um, these guys can survive very low oxygen uh, environments. Just, mm -hmm. They have a uh, physosomous air bladder where they can basically almost, it's very vascularized, they can take it in, um, do this pneumatic duct, which they can then diffuse oxygen in their blood vessels. So they could almost serve it as a temporary lung 
uh, for these guys to breathe. So it's uh, so so in real silty water that doesn't get a lot of oxygen in it. They they'd be fine. Right. That's why these guys like will thrive in backwater type habitats along with like bowfin and uh, those type of ancient fish. Are you giving me this? Yeah, yep. So, yep. 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 <clears throat> okay. So anything different in there? Oh. Sure. Here's another native species we have here. This is a freshwater drum. Uh huh. Um, it's in a different family than these guys. This is cyanidae. And this one is. That looks 13. like a perch. Is that some kind of a perch? A lot of people call them perch. They're not in the same family, but uh, if you talk to a lot of fishermen, they definitely call these uh, drum perch or perch. Um, sheep's head, they go by a lot of different common names. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but uh, these guys, they're pretty omnivorous as well. They'll actually eat uh, mollusks as well, um, snails and things. Mm -hmm. um, Is yeah. he good to eat? They're not wow. bad. It's a, a lot of people make poor man's caviar mm -hmm. out of them, what they, they call them, where they are shrimp, poor man's shrimp out of them, where they'll cut the strips. They got kind of a rubbery texture. But um, no, it's very, it's, it's tasty fish. Some yeah. people eat them, some people don't. It just, it just depends. I'll try to find you something different here. I don't think we got any game fish, did we? There no bass or anything like that. Nope, I don't <clears throat> think we got any in here today. This guy is a, one of our. Whoop. Whoop. Come here, come here. Whoop. This guy here is one of our native suckers. Um, it's in the sucker family, Catastomidae. So he's even holding her, his face. There you go. You're right. That face. If you've ever eaten a buffalo sandwich, uh -huh. this is a smallmouth buffalo. Really? Um, these get quite a bit larger, and we have three species of buffalo in this area as well: a smallmouth, a black, and uh, also a bigmouth buffalo. Mm -hmm. Now some people are crazy about this, this the meat on this fish. Sure, yep, they're, yep, it's really good. But they're Easy. real bony too, aren't they? They are. You have to score them up and then uh, yeah. fry them typically yeah. to eat them. But, but nope, they're a, a good na good native species we have around here. And the big mouth buffalo, its cousin is also. Oh, he's a slimy yeah, devil, isn't he? It's also a zooplanktivore, uh, and that's what <clears throat> people are concerned with those declining due to the invasion of big head carp, because they're also zooplanktivorous. So 414. What was that 16 inches long? 16? Yep, yeah. Yeah, right around 16 inches. That looks like another. Was that a sucker? No, it's another small mouth. Just oh. different shape here, a little bit. So this one's 15 and a half inches, 393. Pull out that big guy for us. There's a big fella. In the here. big carp here. A lot of times I like to cover their eyes a little bit. Mm -hmm. Kind of placates them a little bit. But yep, this is, like I said, these have been around since around the 1870s or so. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people think carp are native, but I, they're, I thought they they're were. not. Right. And they were, they were brought here for a purpose? Yep, a lot for the commercial fishing industry. And now they really don't sell many of them commercially. Yeah. And, and they're really adaptable. They can survive, they eat about anything. They can survive very low oxygen environments. They're young, they actually have their young in areas in low oxygen environments while other fish have bugged out other game fish that might eat their young. It's a, yeah, they're very, they're very adaptable. Are, are there native carp? Not, no, not, not in, in the United States. Not no. in the United States. Okay. We have a native sucker called a river carp sucker, but uh, it's not a carp, it's uh, another sucker. So this is 28 inches, 715. 28 inches. Okay, right. I don't know if we got anything different in there. We got some gars left. Got some. Is there anything different? No catfish. Nope, no catfish either. Huh. It's more buffalo drum. I'll kind of give them a, a net picture here and show you kind of what we do have left. Wow. <laughs> yep. Yep. Some more short nose gar. Yep. That's... Yep. There's another one. Yep. <clears throat> Smallmouth buffalo. Another silver carp. Mm -hmm. Make sure this. Yep. And you know what? They're gonna pretty soon. In fact, they already have found that they, there's a source. There's a, a market for these things now. You know, in China, uh, they're catching them commercially. 
and right. freezing them, skinning them, freezing them, and sending them to China. So maybe that'll improve the situation a little bit. That's what Illinois is working on right now, Illinois DNR. I know they've, they have a spokesman going around right now showing people how to fix it and how good it is and yeah. let them taste test it and everything. But the Chinese love them, <clears throat> especially like the heads as well for yeah. soups. Yeah. And our fish are a lot better quality than, it's kind of funny because in Chinese rivers, adults are extremely rare. Sometimes they'll get larva here and there, but most of our adults come from hatcheries around. And while us, we can't get rid of the adults, yeah. Yeah. you know, right here. Right. So. Well, listen, I want to thank you guys, Jim, Neil, for taking us out here. Sean, for driving that other boat. This has been a great oh, educational no. Glad experience. Glad you've come out. So. Thank you. The Alice L. Kibbe Life Sciences Field Station is open to the public during daylight hours with 12 miles of uh, hiking trails and five geocaches. With another Illinois story in Warsaw, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. For a DVD copy of the program you've just seen, send 1995 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois 62708. Be sure to include the program name, subject, and when the program aired. You can also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605.